In this video, I'm going to give you my initial thoughts as a beginner and a complete newbie to the world of 3D printing on the Ender 3 V2. Make sure you stick around. If you like what you see, hit subscribe below and keep an eye out for more videos. Hi, I'm Will from Will Surridge Tech, and today we're going to be having a look at this, the Ender 3 V2. This is very exciting for me. This is my first 3D printer, so this will be kind of a dummies experience guide rather than a, an actual how-to. Um, I've had this printer in this box for three months now, and so I am very excited to be finally getting it out of this box so I can start using it. So this is all of the components laid out. As you can see, all the fixings are very well labeled, telling you exactly what they are, but some of the actual component parts are less well labeled, or not labeled at all really. The instruction manual is very detailed, but it's quite pernickety and it's quite fine, so you, you've got to keep an eye out and make sure you're not missing out on the key details. So some of the extrusions look very similar, but some of the holes are in slightly different places. And that is detailed in the instruction manual, but it's not very clear. I'm not going to give you a complete build tutorial because there are loads of there out there. Um, instead, I'm going to kind of go through what I've learned uh, throughout the process of building my first 3D printer and getting my first print. Now, I think the x-axis build is the hardest part in the build in that I got it wrong twice. Um, so I'm going to point out the things that I did wrong, so hopefully you won't make the same mistake. Uh, the first thing is the orientation of the x-axis profile. Now obviously, they thought through the design and it all worked perfectly. Obviously I didn't realise that and I built it and then I found that things didn't quite line up or didn't quite work the way I was expecting it to. And the main thing here is the countersink holes. So the countersink holes go on the same side as the roller plates, which means the roller plates can sit flush with the countersink holes because like the bolts from the rollers will slot into the holes and be out the way. If you do it the wrong way around, like I did the first time, then the roller plate kind of sticks out at an angle and that means obviously nothing's flush and nothing lines up. So make sure you get it the right way around, not the wrong way around like me. And obviously you need to do that before you attach all the belts and everything unlike me, otherwise you have to take everything off and take everything apart and it's a bit of a pain. It's really not a complicated build if you do it right. I know that sounds funny, but it's not. The other problem I had with the x-axis uh, actually came with the gantry profile. I just assembled it and I put the gantry profile on. I hadn't realised that the extrusion or the motor cable, ribbon cable and uh, Bowden tube was over the top of the gantry. Obviously that means when I went to put the x-axis down it could only go down a couple of centimetres um, because the cable got caught. So make sure you put the cable under the gantry and then the gantry can sit on top of the cable and then obviously your x-axis bar, so the z-axis, can go all the way down to the bed. Otherwise you're going to end up with a z-axis floating 20 centimetres off the bed, which is no good to anyone. Belt tensioning is something I knew that needed to happen, but I didn't know kind of how much to tension by. I couldn't find anything in the instruction manual and the guides out there weren't particularly clear, so I just kind of made it up. Um, I'm not sure whether this is right, but I kind of went for a tension similar on both axes, the Y and the X, of kind of a mid-range note, something you'd expect to hear on a guitar. Again, not sure whether that's right, and I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who will tell me that was wrong, but that's what I did and it worked, so there we go. So once it's all built, the first thing to do is bed levelling. I'm sure you've seen hundreds of posts out there about people who haven't levelled their bed and have got really bad prints. So it's quite a long process, but it's totally worth it in the long run. My bed came out of the box quite wobbly. Apparently this is normal, and I looked around how to, how to stop it wobbling and I couldn't find anything. Eventually I did find something, but before I'd done that I tried tightening the Allen nut, I tried tightening the bolt at the other end, and it just wasn't doing anything, they felt tight to me. And then I looked that between the roller and the bed, there's actually another spacer. And on one side that spacer is round, so we don't need to worry about that. But on the other side that spacer is hexagonal. 
so we can tighten it there, and that's what you need to do. Get your spanner out and tighten those two just enough for the bed to stop wobbling. We don't want to over tighten it, otherwise it will dig into the rollers and everything. So you just want to tighten it enough, but not too much. Next, we want to lower the bed as much as possible. This is just so when it turns on for the first time, the nozzle's not going to hit into and scrape the glass bed. So we tighten up all of the adjustment nuts, holders, handles, wheels underneath until the bed is nice and low. We can then turn it on and go through the leveling process. First thing you're going to want to do is go into the prepare menu and press auto home. That will home, surprisingly enough, the nozzle. Once it's homed, you then need to disable the stepper motors. If you don't disable the stepper motors and you move the motors manually, then you'll cause problems because currents will flow the wrong way and everything breaks. So make sure you disable the motors before you then try moving them manually. Once you've disabled them, we need to level the bed. What I would suggest is doing this a little bit at a time to start with, because your bed is obviously very low at the moment and we need to bring it up. But if you bring it up too fast on one side, then when you bring out the other side, it might go too high and not be level and end up with the nozzle scraping into it. So I'd suggest on your first time round, you want to be putting the nozzle kind of above each of the wheels. And on your first time round, you probably want a gap of about three millimeters between the nozzle and the bed. And then on your second time round, you can bring that down to about one millimeter between the nozzle and the bed. Then on your third time round, this is when you want to actually try and get it level. So you want to be using a bit of paper underneath the nozzle or between the nozzle and the bed. You want the paper to kind of have a bit of tension in it, but not too much. So it's not stuck there, it can still move around, but you can kind of feel the force of the nozzle on top of it. You want to make sure that you can actually grab the paper, pull it out from under the nozzle, and then slide it back under the nozzle afterwards. That's kind of a good level to have it at. So you do this for all four corners, and then you go back to the first corner and you'll notice it's completely wrong. So you repeat the process for all four corners, and then you go back to the first corner and you realize it's completely wrong. So you repeat it again. Do this a few times until you're happy that the bed is level. And then what you want to do is heat everything up, because obviously when things heat up, they change shape. So we go back to our prepare menu and click preheat PLA. As that's heating up, we can go around again, checking our bed level. Obviously don't wait until it's got too hot, otherwise you might burn yourself. But as it heats up, go around again, and you'll notice things will move. They should only be minor adjustments, but you will need to make adjustments as it's heating up. Now, in theory, we're ready for our first print. So we should just be able to plug the SD card in that came with the 3D printer, and there should be some test files on there. So I plug the SD card in, go to print, and there are no test files on there. In fact, nothing's popping up. Irritating. So I obviously took the SD card and plugged it into my laptop, opened it up, and there are some test files there. Odd. It turns out that the, what is also on this SD card is a selection of folders with manuals or software or whatever it you know, comes preloaded. Um, but the naming of these folders had some sort of odd apostrophe comma situation in the file name, which the printer obviously couldn't handle or couldn't interpret. So if you also have this problem, just delete that funny symbol from the file names or the folder names and then when you plug it back into the 3D printer, it should just work. Obviously, I plugged the, plugged the SD card back in, went to print menu and chose one of the test prints. Naturally, I chose a cute little dog. I have to admit, I was very surprised when out came a very good print. Obviously, it's not perfect, but for a first print, it looked like a dog. There were a couple of splodges, there was a little bit of stringing, but fundamentally, it was a dog. So I'm very happy with that. Of course, I then went on to print a benchmark test. This is a print that kind of tests loads of different things for you. I'll leave a link down below to the Thingiverse where I got that from. If you don't know what Thingiverse is, it's basically a website with loads of 3D prints that you can download and print for yourself. We then need to turn the 3D file from Thingiverse into G-code, and for that we use a software called a slicer. I'm using Cura. So this benchmark went to print and it came out and again, I was very impressed with it. We can see that the overhangs worked very well up until about 70, 65, 70 degrees uh, and you can start seeing a bit of artifact underneath them at that point. The 
Towers look great with a little bit of string in between them. The pyramids are good, but have a few artifacts on them. And the bridges all look great. So it worked. It wasn't a perfect print, but I have to say it does exactly what I would hope it would do. And it looks like it works and none of it fell over. There weren't any hideous failings in it. So I'm very happy. All I can say is if you're thinking about getting a 3D printer, then get one. It's really not as complicated as people make it out to be. I'm sure 3D printers have evolved a lot, but I had very little problems. All problems that were very easily fixable by myself or a Google if I really struggled. All I can say is I'm very happy with it and I'm sure it's going to feature in plenty more videos to come. That's all I'm going to say about it for now, but keep an eye out for more. I just wanted to say thank you so much for all your support over the last seven months. This channel has grown a lot bigger than I was expecting it to and a lot quicker than I was expecting it to and I've really enjoyed making these videos for you and enjoying the community that has formed around these videos. And please make sure you are hitting that subscribe button. Only 14% of you guys who are watching this are actually subscribed to my channel. And that's sad because the more of you that subscribe, the more people YouTube will tell to watch my videos and then the bigger this community can grow, which is really what I want. I want to be helping more and more of you. And I can only do that if you watch my videos. So please hit subscribe below. As always, feel free to reach out to me in the comments or on social media or via email and I'll do my best to help you out or if you just want to have a chat or even if you have any ideas of videos that you'd like me to make. So there we go, the end of 3, V2. Make sure you hit subscribe below and click that bell icon to find out more about my smart tech and how you can build yourself the ultimate smart home.